you are one of those people who follow forums uh, and social media on the internet about naval history and naval technology, you will know that one of the subjects that is often discussed is why the Soviet and now Russian uh, designs for the aircraft carriers are uh, so inferior to the American designs. Which is actually true if you measure the capability of the design according to the American metrics. In any case, developing countries like India or China are starting in these years their naval aviation journey from Russian-inspired designs. Why are they using those designs as an inspiration? This is the first of a mini-series of two videos discussing the evolution of the Soviet naval aviation doctrine and the long shadows that it is still casting on modern navies today. As usual, stay till the end because this is a story that is not easy to find anywhere else. And if you stay till the end, YouTube will know that this is a good video and it will show it to other people who may be interested. At the end of the Second World War, the Minister of the Soviet Navy, the Admiral Nikolai G. Kuznetsov, was well aware of what has happened at sea, even if Soviet operations have been on a very small scale. He was well aware of the preeminence of the aircraft carrier that actually superseded the battleship as the cornerstone of the power at sea. In 1945, while the war was drawing to a close, he proposed a plan for nine heavy aircraft carriers and six light carriers. Stalin and other top echelons of the party were actually not convinced. The shipbuilding industry was recovering from the war and after all, aircraft carriers didn't seem to be the priority. For a while, Stalin toyed with the idea of building a couple of light aircraft carriers just to acquire some carrier experience, but even that idea was abandoned in the end. Stalin itself defined the Soviet naval strategy by saying, we are not going to fight at sea by the shores of America. Actually, Till Stalin's death, he himself and Kuznetsov re periodically revisited the idea, but nothing was ever done. When Khrushchev came to power in 1953, Kuznetsov proposed a carrier building plan as well, but Khrushchev and his defense minister Bulganin were not impressed. Again, they did not believe it was a priority for the Soviet Union. It was becoming increasingly clear that the conflict between the East and the West was going to be mainly a land-based clash. However, this did not mean that there was no naval dimension. Actually, there was a rather important one. A large fraction of the NATO forces and an even larger fraction of the supplies that the NATO required to fight the world, uh, was actually stationed in the North American continent. Moving these assets to continental Europe was obviously key to successfully confronting the Soviet and the other Eastern European forces, and obviously this was going to happen by sea. So at the end, the only really relevant mission of the Soviet Navy became disrupting this flow of supplies in the middle of the Atlantic. When Admiral Sergei Gorshov replaced Kuznetsov in 1956, this mission was made official. Gorshkov declared that with the advent of the anti-ship missile, the American carriers were only large targets. Obviously, this meant it became very difficult for the Soviets to justify any investment in carrier-based aviation. So the Soviet Navy became focused on submarines and anti-ship missiles, either surface-launched or air-launched. 
It is in this period that the Soviet Union starts building its own naval bomber force. So the plans for building a carrier force went definitely out of the door. Like it happens every time you throw something out of the door, carrier base naval aviation came back from the window. In the 60s, America's SLBM's menace was becoming real. At the time, the nightmare scenario was a launch with a low trajectory from uh, waters not too far from the Soviet Union and a tactic that would have left very little time for a reaction. On their side, the Soviets started to operate their ICBM from under the polar ice cap. There they were safe from detection and they would have survived any possible kind of counterforce attack. Since nothing lasts forever, American attack submarines started operating under the polar ice cap to hunt the Soviet ICBMs. So these two new American threats actually prompted for a Soviet reaction. The Soviets had to ramp up their anti-submarine capabilities and one of the new assets for the mission was the Moskva-class helicopter carriers. The two Moskvas were relatively large uh, helicopter carriers with an air wing composed by 14 Camov 25 helicopters. The ship itself was heavily armed with anti-submarine weapons. And not that the helicopters at sea were anything new, but it was the first time that the Soviets were operating a carrier air wing at sea uh, with the purpose of uh, controlling an area of the uh, sea uh, with airborne assets. And when the ships were first identified, Western navies basically freaked out. To be honest, the ships themselves were no more dangerous than other naval assets that the Soviets already had. And actually, they started showing some limitations and problems quite soon. Um, and that probably was natural because they were the first helicopter carriers ever built in the Soviet Union. What concerned the NATO admirals was the fact that they were thinking that the Moskvas and the helicopters were the first step that was going to take to Soviet carrier battle groups. They were concerned because even a limited number of Soviet carrier groups would have severely limited the options of the American carrier groups. Soviet carrier groups meant that rather than just patrolling the Atlantic up and down, making sure that the Soviet Navy of the North and the Baltic was not going to exit and get into the Atlantic, they would have had to fight a proper battle to make the Soviet carrier groups inoperable. These concerns seemed even more justified in 1972 when the first of the Kiev's aircraft-carrying cruisers was actually launched. The carrier wing was composed by a dozen of Yak-38 Forgers and about 20 more helicopters. The ship armament in this case seemed to be oriented toward uh, surface-to-air defense like would have been on a Western carrier. However, there was an oddity. In fact, there was a battery of anti-ship missile and, well, everybody thought that after all, the Soviet had their own quirks and twists. The Yak-38 Forger is often considered a mediocre jet and indeed it was less sophisticated than the Harrier. However, if compared with contemporary versions of the Harrier, it had slightly better performances and in particular it had a much longer range in air-to-air -air configuration. The icing on the cake for the Western commands was the leak news that the Soviets were working on a 80,000 tons conventional Katobar project named Oral. 
The configuration of the ship was never finalized, but he had to be a nuclear power carrier with an air wing of about 70 combat planes, apparently heavily inspired to the American designs. After the end of the Cold War, in fact, it was ascertained that there was at the time a new current within the um, top ranks of the Soviet Navy that was pushing for the adoption of carrier battle groups uh, similar to the American models. However, this current was once again sidelined by the then Minister of Defense Dmitry Ustinov and under his tenure the Oral project was actually scrapped. Project Oral had been considered too expensive, too complex and definitely not aligned with the main mission of the Red Fleet. So the next generation of Soviet carriers was an evolutionary project with a Stobar configuration that was going to become the Ulyanovs class. In the meanwhile, the NATO admirals were following these developments with increasing concerns. The Soviet capabilities kept improving and in their mind it was clear that sooner or later they would have to confront with Soviet carrier battle groups that would only have compounded with the assets that the Soviets already had in place. At least this was the unanimous consensus among the analysts and like it always happens they were completely wrong. But this is going to be the story of the next video. In fact, in the next video, we are going to answer the question where we started from. Why the Soviet and now Russian designs are so popular with the emerging countries. episode of this mini-series we went through the development of the Soviet aircraft carriers that was followed by the West with increasing concern but it was shaped by a mission and a doctrine different from the American and the Western in general. In the second and final episode, if you stay with me till the end, we will see how and why it developed so differently why the Western concern was not justified and why the legacy of the Soviet design has been passed on to the developing countries. At the end of the 70s, the Soviet Navy was building the last of the Kiev-class carriers. It was considered a great improvement over the Moskva and it did expand the capabilities of the Soviet surface groups. However, the Kiev could have been considered light carriers according to the Western standards. As the British demonstrated at the Falklands, a light carrier is much better than no carrier, so the NATO fleets were concerned about the progressive improvement of the Soviet naval aviation. What some NATO analysts failed to realize at the time was that this improvement had to be put in a perspective totally different from the American perspective. The Americans and the NATO valued the carriers as weapons capable of exerting control over a large area of the ocean and project air power against ground targets. The Soviets didn't really care. They didn't care because their mission was to stop the naval traffic in the North Atlantic carrying reinforcement to Europe. 
they did not need a cover group for that at all. At the beginning of the 80s, the Soviet fleet had the capabilities required for the mission of closing the Atlantic, and they were based on three pillars. The submarines, actually hundreds of them. The surface groups armed with long-range surface-to-surface missiles. And finally, the nightmare of the NATO commanders, the land-based naval aviation. Hundreds of Tupolev 22M backfire based on the Kola Peninsula and in the Far East were the most fearsome weapons of the Soviet naval aviation. The backfires had a range of thousands of kilometers, they could sprint at Mach 2 to launch the weapons or escape the fighters, and they could carry two or three almost hypersonic, long-range, large and heavy missiles. This force could easily saturate the defenses of a battle group. The Soviets were conscious that an American carrier group was a formidable opponent, capable of inflicting and absorbing a large amount of damage. But the Americans were also conscious that the cornerstone of their naval power could be rendered useless in an afternoon by just a couple of AS-4 missiles hitting the carrier. The F-14 Tomcat, the Phoenix missile, the Aegis system and the SM-2 missiles were all different ways to counter this menace. So the Soviets did not need conventional carrier groups to close the Atlantic, they already had what they needed. What they were in search for, though, was a way to improve the effectiveness of their weapons. While it is true that the Soviet Navy in the 70s was still toying with the idea of a design similar to the American carriers, they end up settling for an evolutionary design based on a Stobar configuration because, at the end, they recognized that it was everything that was needed. The design of the Riga-class carriers was considered an incremental development from the Kiev. The ships are a bit larger than the Kiev and they have a sky jump rather than catapults. This design, as we already said, imposes quite a severe limitation to the payload of the planes taking off, but it was not perceived as a particular problem. The mission of the ship was just to provide air cover. The naval version of the Sukhoi 27 planned to be used on board of this vessel, which, that is the Sukhoi 33, operated exclusively with an air-to-air -air payload, usually lighter than the anti-ship or the air-to-ground typical payload. The operational concept behind the use of the carriers was twofold. In the context of a surface group armed with long-range anti-ship missiles, the carrier was supposed to provide air cover. Since the main surface weapon the NATO was going to use against the group was the air power, then providing air coverage to the group itself was going to entirely make sense. The group offensive weapons were the missiles, not the planes, and that was the reason why the carrier featured surface-to-surface -surface missiles to add to those of the group. A surface group with fixed wing air cover was a much more hardened target for the American naval aviation. However, the Soviet carriers were supposed to have another purpose as a force multiplier. Since the contrast of the Soviet land-based naval aviation was still a task for the American carrier air wing, the fighters on uh, a Soviet carrier also had the purpose to distract the American fighters from the bombers. Luckily, this never happened, but it is safe to suppose that the Tomcat launched to intercept a Tupolev 95 maritime reconnaissance plane or a, a regiment of Tupolev 22M would be distracted a lot by its target if attacked by a Sukhoi 33. The embarked planes would have acted as escorts for the bombers. The reason why land-based fighters were not really a feasible option was that the range of the backfire was two or three times the range of every operational fighter and the amount of air refueling assets that would have been necessary would have greatly increased the complexity and the vulnerability of the whole force. Then, the fall of the Soviet Union in the early 90s turned all these plans into nothing. The Indian Navy 
is a blue water navy, a navy that is equipped to operate in the ocean far away from its own bases and from land-based air cover. In fact, the Indian naval doctrine predicates the sea control over the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal and beyond. India is a maritime country because the vast majority of its foreign exchanges happen by ship. The Indian Navy exists primarily to preserve these commercial routes if and when this will be necessary, but also to defend the maritime borders of India and to be a deterrent for any potential threat. The original plan for the 21st century was to deploy three carrier battle groups, one for each continental side with one in reserve or refitting. Aircraft carriers are the cornerstone of a Blue Water Navy because the embarked aircraft can patrol an area much larger than the surface ships. Also, the carriers can project air power on the sea over land up to a certain depth and they can provide air cover to amphibious landings. In general, they provide a decisive advantage over those who do not have a carrier. India operated a cattlebar ship and a light carrier in the past, both second-hand British designs modified quite heavily for Indian news. When it was time to replace the Virat in the early 2000s, there were no more second-hand Western ships readily available. Actually, India has a long-term policy to become as independent as possible in defense equipment, so a program for an indigenous carrier was actually started in 2004. In the meanwhile, India was in search of a shorter term replacement and there was an option that just seemed a no-brainer. The ex-Soviet Kiev-class Baku carrier was mothballed waiting to learn its destiny. When India signed a contract to acquire the ship, it was only 11 years old, eight of which spent in reserve. The carrier was free, but the reactivation and the updates asked by the Indians were priced at less than a billion dollars which is a very cheap price for a carrier. The acquisition though turned out to be a nightmare. Costs ballooned, delays mounted and the ship was finally commissioned only in 2014. The ship delivered however was a different design than the Kiev. The entire boat third of the ship had been removed and replaced with a new section of the flight deck with a rather tall sky jump. So India, despite commissioning an entirely new ship, had chosen a Stobar configuration. We have already seen that a configuration like this penalizes the maximum takeoff weight. Uh, the actual penalty varies depending on various factors, but to give an order of magnitude, the maximum takeoff weight may be reduced roughly by 35% in a Stobar configuration. Additionally, some planes that do not have a fighter jet acceleration can't physically take off from a sky jump, like the airborne early warning planes or the transport planes. This penalty was not a key factor for the Soviet Union since their doctrine was to use the planes just for air-to-air -air operations or reconnaissance at most. But India wants to use its carrier groups for sea control. The answer to this conundrum came in the form of the MiG-29K. While the Soviet and the Russian Navy had chosen the Sukhoi-33, a variant of the Sukhoi-27 optimized for air-to-air -air carrier operations, the MiG Bureau developed on its own initiative the MiG-29K, a variant of the MiG-29 modified for carrier use and capable of using air-to-ground and anti-ship weapons. Turning a land-based design into a carrier based is not easy. The first problem is that the undercarriage and the structure must be strengthened. A tile hook needs to be added and the anti-corrosion measures must be much more effective to withstand the effect of salt water. To compensate the added weight and put up with a very short takeoff run, a maximum of 195 meters, but it can be as short as 95, then the engines were upgraded to provide about 7% more thrust, the wings had their surface increased and a folding mechanism was added. For storage, obviously. The maximum payload, though, is just 5.5 tons and I expect that, in practice, a good portion of it needs to be sacrificed for the range. However, with the MiG-29K, it was possible to operate a supersonic multi-role fighter adequate for the level of the threat the Indians may face, albeit with some limitation. The ship is reported to operate with an air wing of 24 jets and 10 helicopters of various types, 
good enough to establish their superiority and exert the sea control. This is not the end of the story though, because the Indian indigenously built Vikrant aircraft carrier is expected to enter service in 2023, according to the latest news and it is again a Stobar design. The MiG-29K will fly from the new carrier and maybe a naval version of the Tejas. However, it seems that the Indian Navy is also considering the naval version of the Rafale, which would make sense considering that the Air Force is already introducing it, even if the Rafale M is designed for the catapult. In the last couple of decades, the Chinese Navy has steadily grown under a process that clearly aims for the stars. From a coastal defensive service, it turned into an offensive-minded force designed to be part of the process to gain control of the first chain of islands off the Chinese coast, if a conflict should start. According to the official documents, the Chinese are planning a fleet of six carrier groups, in groups of two, each operating in a separate theater, north, central and south. However, while India had a small but consolidated naval aviation tradition, China had none. China in the 90s purchased two of the surviving Soviet Kiev ships, using them as attraction in amusement parks or turning them into luxury hotels. So it was not suspicious when a Chinese businessman offered to purchase from the Ukraine the unfinished Baryag, the second and never finished Riga class Stobar aircraft carrier. The story of the purchase and the delivery would be amazing in itself, but what matters for our analysis is that the ship that arrived in Dalian in 2002 and in 2005 the refitting operation was started. The Chinese shipbuilding industry had already acquired the technical expertise to complete the ship and in 2011 rebuilt and updated it started the sea trials under the name Liaoning. And if the Chinese had the competency to rebuild the ship relatively quickly, building a naval aviation was a totally different matter. The Liaoning air wing is composed by 24 J-15 fighters and a dozen helicopters of various kinds. The J-15 is a derivation from the J-11, in turn derived from the Russian Sukhoi-27, and it was augmented with the reverse engineering of Sukhoi-33 prototype, acquired in circumstances not entirely clear from Ukraine. There has been friction between Russia and China on this subject of reverse engineering, but still the Chinese are one of the best Russian customers, so yeah. Even if the J-15 turned out to be a workable interim solution, building a naval aviation requires a set of institutional experience and tradition that may require decades if built from scratch. After all, the Soviets started in the mid-50s and by the late 80s they still did not develop the same proficiency of the United States, France or the UK. So the Chinese asked for help in a really surprising place. Brazil. The Brazilian Navy in fact successfully operated Catobar carriers since the 60s, acquired from the UK and France, and it is still operating an ex-British light carrier today. So the Brazilians trained the first generation of naval aviation sailors for the Chinese Navy. The Liaoning for quite a few years was designed as a training ship, while the Navy was trying to form an experienced corps of personnel capable of training the next generation and support the further expansion already planned. And the expansion is already ongoing with the second aircraft carrier, the Shandong, being commissioned in December 2019. It took about six years to build it from scratch as an improved and slightly larger version of the Liaoning. Western analysts believe that the two ships will still work relentlessly to train pilots and other personnel while achieving some level of operational capability. This capability can only be considered similar to the original Soviet idea of providing air cover to surface groups and fighter escorts to land-based planes. The two ships are known as the Type 001 and Type 002, but there is a Type 003 already in the making and its commissioning is expected to happen around 2023. In this case, it will be definitely a step up. In fact, 
The carrier being built is expected to be around 85,000 tons, almost twice as much as the two previous ships. It will have a catabar configuration with electromagnetic catapults, albeit the propulsion won't be nuclear. Even the carrier wing is expected to be different with naval versions of the most recent Chinese fighters like the J-20 or the J-31 and other complements like air refueling and early warning platforms, like in an American or a French carrier group. And the Type 003 is not the end, since there are already news of a Type 004, which is expected to be even larger and nuclear powered. This betrays obviously the long term strategy of the Chinese Navy. It is obvious that the plan is to develop a naval force capable of confronting the US, the US Navy on its own terms. Large carriers like the American carriers do exist to exert the naval diplomacy, control the sea and eventually project power from the sea. This is something that the United States do regularly and it seems that the Chinese are going to play the same game. I'm sure that everybody is hoping that it will stay a game. We have come a long way in these two videos, from the Moskva in the 50s to the most modern Indian and Chinese carriers being built and commissioned as we speak. It is clear that the Soviet technology has been the foundation of this de development, even if none of these countries would have chosen to do so, if possible. The very fact of relying on a stobar design defines the capabilities and the use that a navy can do of the carrier and the capability that are going to be deployed. While the Indians are going to depend from the Russians for a while, the Chinese are rapidly becoming autonomous. While the Indians have designed a strategy tailored on their status of a large regional power, it is clear that the Chinese have a strategy with nearly global ambitions. However, despite how surprising this may be, the roots of both nations' naval air power are in the same place, in Russia. I'm sorry, but this doesn't make sense at all. Sir, according to my research, this is the situation. What is the Chinese Navy has one ex-Soviet carrier, a copy of an ex-Soviet carrier, they are building a indigenous medium carrier, and that's basically it. They also put on hold the building of the fort carrier. This is at best an incomplete view, sir. What is this is the Chinese Navy, it's not the US Navy. They don't have the same power projection requirements. In fact, they don't. Their purpose is different. Okay, so what's the purpose for you? Let me explain, sir. Hey, we have already covered the recent history of the efforts of the Chinese Navy to acquire aircraft carrier capabilities in the context of the description of the long shadow that has been cast by the Soviet naval aviation on many modern navies. The video covers a lot of details and if you're interested, you can find it here. For our purpose today, it's enough to recall that China operates two aircraft carriers. The first is actually the ex-Soviet ship Variag, purchased in shady circumstances in 1998. There was an adventurous towing to China, a long refit, and finally in 2016, the ship has been declared operational under the name of Liaoning. But that wasn't to remain an isolated case. In 2007, China purchased from Russia four sets of aircraft carrier landing arrest equipment. So this was a clear indication that something else was going to happen. And in fact, in 2013, the building of an entirely domestic carrier was started. The ship was actually a bigger and slightly more capable copy of the Liaoning, with a displacement of about 70,000 tons. The lessons learned with the Liaoning had been put in practice with the Shandong, this is the name of the second carrier, increasing the room available for the aircraft and also improving the deck operations. At the end of 2019, the carrier was declared 
combat ready. And after the Shandong, nobody expected the Chinese to stop there. And in fact, the Type 003 came along. In 2016 and 2017, reports about this new aircraft carrier started to appear in the specialized press. Soon it was clear that in Shanghai something big was being built by the Jiangnam Shipyard Group. In mind, this is not the same Dalian shipyard that built the previous two, so the Chinese have two shipyards with the capability of building aircraft carriers. We don't know much about the ship, but all the information that we have, which comes from the fragments of information that are actually published on the Chinese internet, rather than from the satellite pictures that we have of the construction, have been really dissected by the analysts. So we can have some rough estimates about the ship. The most recent estimates place the Type 003 at 318 meters length with a beam of 78 meters on the flight deck. The displacement has been estimated to be a little shy of 100,000 tons, larger than the initial estimates. Overall, this means that the carrier is probably just slightly smaller than the Gerald Ford class. Some analysts actually believe that the ship was going to be some sort of an intermediate model akin to what the Kitty Hawk had been many years ago in the United States fleet, but it doesn't seem to be the case. So the Chinese apparently skip a generation and the fact that there is a large basin being built in the south that is pretty much just big enough to host a Type 003 is probably telling us that this is going to be a sort of a standard measure for Chinese aircraft for the years to come. The Type 003 is still being built, but we can identify some differences with the Ford class. For example, the Type 003 doesn't feature a nuclear propulsion, but its propulsion system is not entirely conventional either. In fact, it seems that the ship is going to have an integrated electric propulsion. This means that turbines, boilers or any other power generating element on board of the ship is not connected directly with the propellers, but is only used to produce electrical power, which is transferred to electrical engines driving the propellers. This type of propulsion is becoming increasingly popular because it has several advantages in terms of design but also efficiency compared with older configurations. But this choice also makes sense because the Type 003 will be equipped with three electromagnetic catapults, each one of those 105 meters long. On a carrier flight deck, basically we just see a rail with a shuttle moving on it. But actually a catapult is a relatively large system that that may influence the whole ship design. For example, steam catapults require the boiler to generate the steams and all the piping required to bring the steam from the boiler uh, to the catapult that has a complex mechanical system that pushes the aircraft when is needed. On the contrary, electromagnetic catapults require a large amount of electric power being delivered very quickly to accelerate the aircraft. And this requires to bring the electrical power to accumulation devices and all uh, the cabling that is actually required, all the control systems. In the United States, the development of the emails has been long and bumpy, but the advantages of the solution compared with the steam catapults is quite clear. The Chinese don't have any direct experience, but even in this case, they have decided to skip a generation and point directly to the most modern solution. Another element that heavily influences the design of the ship is the hangar. It seems that the hangar of the Type 003 is going to be slightly smaller than the Ford class hangar and it will have only two large aircraft elevators rather than the three that are present on the Ford class. The ship is expected to be launched in 2022, to be delivered in 2024, and to reach the initial operational capability in 2025 or 2026. However, the Chinese don't have any experience in running a cattle bar carrier, so delays are definitely possible. And this consideration, rather than budgetary concerns, is probably the reason why the Chinese have decided to pull the project of the Type 004, a nuclear aircraft carrier, on hold for the moment. 
In fact, if we have to listen to official plan statements, the service is actually still evaluating aircraft carriers to see if they're useful or not. So in theory, current carriers, including 003, are all experimental carriers, useful to train people, establish a doctrine, and establish a naval tradition about aircraft carriers. So, while it's obviously true that the Chinese Navy has to go through a learning curve, this entire approach doesn't seem to be realistic. And this is what Otis was saying at the beginning. And actually, he has an idea. Carriers allow sea control over critical trade routes, and they project air power over coastal areas up to a depth into the continental mass that includes the bulk of the population. They can deny the use of the sea to an opponent, and they can protect friendly or neutral sea traffic that is essential for the survival. And in fact, the United States uses the carriers to project power globally. This is basically what a maritime empire does, and the United States are a maritime empire, even though I'm well aware that this way of putting things is definitely not politically correct. But what is the imperial drive for China? Well, for China is the necessity of having access to energy and food. The most important maritime routes for China are those that lead to the Middle East for oil. So, from the point of view of China, it may seem reasonable to have a force of aircraft carrier capable of protecting those trade routes from the only opponent that, in theory, has the possibility and the capability to shut them off, the United States. However, look at the map. Well, it looks like China has a problem. Right here, the Malacca Strait. It is a choke point surrounded by countries whose allegiance may not necessarily be to the Chinese. Those countries may host American or Western coalition forces that build a barrier that make the Middle East and Africa completely inaccessible, even without aircraft carriers. If the United States could assure the loyalty of countries like Singapore, but also Malaysia or uh, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, there is no way for the, that the Chinese could open up that route. In that case, the only possibility for the Chinese would be a physical invasion of those land areas or a neutralization of all the infrastructures that would be used by a Western coalition in those areas. And now, what would you need to do such an operation? Well, obviously an invasion force, an amphibious force, But mostly, you need air superiority. And the only way to bring aircraft from China in the area against an hostile opposition? Yeah, it's a force of aircraft carriers. Okay, but now, don't forget that the American carriers will still be there. And with the carriers still available, what should you do before acquiring the control of the Straits? West for a long time has been sort of assumed that the long-term plan of the Chinese was to deploy six aircraft carrier, two in the north, two in the south and two in the east facing Taiwan, where the carrier were going to become the centerpiece of a defensive system that goes beyond the first island chain. However, some analysts have found older Chinese publications that actually hint to something different. In some Chinese publications, it is stated that they are well aware that no real confrontation with the United States may happen till the Chinese Navy is actually capable of fighting and winning against the US Navy in blue waters. And to do so, they assess that at least a force of 10 aircraft carriers was needed. In mind, the Chinese always make long-term plans. So, what if, and it, this is a what if, this is a speculation, what if 
the TEP004 carriers and eventually the a future 005 are going to be designed to attack and defeat the US Navy in blue water. What if they are not going to be defensive tools, but they're going to be offensive weapons? What kind of ship do you need? And in particular, what kind of carrier group and what kind of carrier wing do you need to execute this mission? Well, this will be the subject of the next video. Okay, let's talk Chinese carrier wings. So, in the last video we discussed what may be the long-term plan of the Chinese Navy from a strategic point of view. The aircraft carrier Type 003 is going to be launched soon, the Type 004 will follow and then surely there is a long-term plan on how to use them. The end state in 10 or 15 years is going to be a carrier fleet, but its main mission is probably still uncertain. It can either be the centerpiece of a defensive posture to defend the first and the second island chain, or it could be an offensive force to contrast the US Navy in blue waters and to support ground operations in the Malacca Strait. Or it could even evolve from a defensive force to an offensive force for what we know. Fact is, the US Navy is the only opponent that could conceivably contrast a fleet of 6 to 10 Type 003 and 004 aircraft carriers trying to access the Indian Ocean. Sir. I suspect many Indian viewers will be upset by this observation. Come on, Otis, let me have some fun from time to time. Anyway, the carrier is only a mobile infrastructure. What makes the carrier worth having is the carrier wing. In fact, the capabilities of the aircraft based on the carrier are basically the offensive capabilities of the carrier group. Some kind viewers in the previous video pointed out how the Chinese are intensely working on hypersonic and ballistic anti-ship weapons. And these may indeed be another piece of the puzzle. In fact, these weapons in the near future may become an important part of the capabilities provided by the carrier battle group. However, this is a subject for another time. In this video, we are focusing on the potential carrier wing of the Type 003 and 004. And since we like being different, where everybody else would start from the fighters, we start from the force multipliers. Oaxes, tankers, drones. Probably the most important force multipliers of all are the airborne early warning radars. And in September 2020, the KJ-600 made its maiden flight. The Chinese have invested heavily in the development of OAXs and they have several models in service. However, it is not easy to convert that kind of platform for naval use. In fact, albeit some have found some similarities with the larger Xi'an Y7, the KJ-600 is smaller and probably designed a dock. Its development though was unusually long for the Chinese. In fact, it was necessary to build a technology demonstrator. The JZY-01 flew for the first time in, in 2001. It has been used during the years to test several different configurations and the current configuration has been seen for the first time in 2012. The KJ-600 has the same general configuration of the two Okai because, uh, well, it's, it's just concurrent engineering. There is nothing intrinsically special or secret in the E2 platform. As we speak in April 2022, the aircraft is still in development, so we don't have a wealth of news about it. 
The Radum seems to be an actually rotating Radum, which is different from the most recent Chinese configurations, but it seems unlikely that the radar is not going to be an AISA radar. Some sources are reporting that the KJ600 is going to benefit of a very advanced solution in terms of battle management and network-centric warfare. It is suspected to have four or five operators' stations that will benefit of the integration with an indigenous high-speed data link, the DTS-03. The data link will feature a bandwidth of 2 megabit per second, a range of 400 kilometers, and it will support, obviously, voice and data communications. Sir, have you ever wondered if military data links do support music streaming? Uh, please ignore him. We don't know if the DTS-03 supports music, but we know that the DTS-03 supports adopt networking. This means that the network can be formed spontaneously and can be composed by all the assets that support the data link within range without the necessity of having a node or several nodes to create the network. Probably in different contexts, it would be called a peer-to-peer -peer network. Some numbers about the radar range have been bouncing around in the press, but they are the usual meaningless numbers. What seems certain, though, is that the KJ600 is going to be a definitely an improvement if compared with the current situation. In fact, on the current type 001 and 002, the Liaoning and the Shandong, the Chinese used Kamov, 31 helicopters in the same role. And it is clear that the KJ600, compared with the helicopters, will have more time on station, more operators, more computing power, more electrical power, and it will be faster. <laughs> All observers agree that the KJ600 will require a catapult to take off from a carrier, so it surely won't be on board of 001 and 002, but it seems only logical that it will be deployed on 003 and uh, following. We have no news of the introduction of a tanker aircraft on the Type 003 carrier. This may not be an anomaly since even the United States Navy doesn't have a dedicated tanker anymore and the F-18 uh, covers this uh, role too. But this is a missing capability, it is a compromise, it is not by design. In fact, this is going to change in the near future with the introduction of the MQ-25 in the United States, but there is no sign that the Chinese are going down this way as well. We can speculate that once you have a platform like the KJ-600, while removing all the electronics and all the OX equipment, you can possibly adapt that platform for the tanker role. But this is just speculation. China, since 2019, has introduced in service a stealth UCAV, the GJ-11 Sharp Sword, which probably a world first. It has a flying wing configuration, not too dissimilar from the MQ-25 or the Neuron, the Okotnik, and several other experimental projects. It is designed as a ground attack unit and it has two weapon bays that can house each kind of compact PGMs. We know that it is in service with the Air Force, but its actual use so far it is actually shrouded in secrecy. The wingspan is estimated to be 14 meters, the empty weight is 6,350 kilos, and the maximum takeoff weight is 20,200 kilos. It is subsonic, the engine has no afterburner, and the speed is estimated to be around 500 knots. The transfer range is declared to be about 4,000 kilometers, which means that probably the combat uh, range is in the region of a bit more than 1,000 kilometers. Not enormous, but pretty decent. Some analysts believe that the aircraft as it is now cannot operate from carriers, and granted, it will need an adaptation. However, if the engine thrust is probably low for carrier operations, the wing seems capable of quite a lot of lift, 
and you can spot quite large flaps on the trailing edge. So while it is questionable that it could take off from a ski jump, I don't believe there will be any special issues in launching it from a catapult, even at maximum takeoff weight. The maximum takeoff weight is a bit high, but that's what the sources are saying, so take it with a pinch of salt. In any case, there are official drawings that show a drone like the GJ-11 on the deck of a Type 003 or Type 004 carrier, or even on the deck of the conjectured Type 076 amphibious assault ship. All these three types of ships will be equipped with electromagnetic catapults, at least according to the plans. Operating a drone from a carrier is obviously more challenging than operating a drone from a land base. However, it is a technology that doesn't require a particular breakthrough, so it is probably within reach of everyone who wants to put the effort in it. And if this was the case, it may well happen that the Chinese are going to be the first to deploy a combat drone on board of a carrier. All these systems that we have just described do exist with the purpose of supporting the combat component of the carrier wing. And the combat component will be the subject of the next video. Hey, in the first video of this series, we have discussed the Chinese aircraft carrier type 003, which is probably going to be launched this year. In the second video of the series, we discussed the force multipliers that are likely going to be part of the carrier wing. In this video, we are going to discuss the combat component of the air wing. So be prepared for J-15, J-20 and something unexpected about the brand new J-35. The Xinyang J-15 is the current centerpiece of Chinese naval aviation. The translation of the Chinese name means Flying Shark, while the NATO moniker is Flanker X-2. Yes, because the J-15 is actually one of the many Flanker variants that populate non-Western aligned air forces around the world. I always stress that the Chinese do copy way less than is commonly believed, but in this case the J-15 is indeed a copy, a reverse engineering of a Suhoi 33 prototype that was sold by the Ukraine. The prototype was acquired in 2001, the project started in 2006 and the first flight happened quite quickly in 2009. Problem was, Russia was not okay with China copying the aircraft and something similar actually happened with the J-11. So there has been quite a long and harsh confrontation about intellectual property between Russia and China, but this is a story for another time. 2012, the aircraft landed for the first time on the Chinese aircraft carrier Liaoning. That was in the end of development, in fact in the same year the first dual-seater took the skies. It is not clear how many aircraft are in service at the moment, we are in 2022, even because there have been a few accidents. It should be around 60 aircraft considering that right now the third production batch is running. These aircraft currently form the carrier air wing of the two aircraft carriers in service, the Liaoning and the Shandong. However, even though the two carriers and their air wing is considered combat ready, the main mission of these two carriers is to train pilots and personnel. About the aircraft itself, well, it's a flanker. So it looks like a flanker it flies like a flanker. It has the same structure, performance and aerodynamics of a flanker. However, it is a Chinese flanker. In fact, the avionics has been derived from the J-11 and it is largely national, albeit it has been inspired by some Russian solutions. The Chinese have declared that 90% of the components are in fact Chinese. And if you consider that the aircraft may fly with Russian engines, well, judge for yourself. There has been a long-running querelle 
among the Western analysts, some believe that J15 is superior performance-wise to the Suhoi 33, but not as sophisticated as the Suhoi 35. Others simply believe that it is utter junk. Sir, this is not politically correct. Okay, some believe that the reverse engineering was not adequate and this led to issues regarding the flight controls and the aircraft structure. And indeed, if the original Suhoi 33 was already a relatively heavy carrier aircraft, the J-15 is even heavier. It is actually an aircraft that polarizes the judgment quite a lot, which means that we are not really sure about this aircraft, because if we were sure, pretty much the judgment uh, would have been rather uniform, no? The one thing that seems certain, though, is that the current carrier configuration is really penalizing for the aircraft. Since both carriers are ski jump carriers, the takeoff weight of the aircraft is really penalized, and this is something the J-15 doesn't need because it is already quite heavy. So, for example, if a full fuel load is embarked, the aircraft payload is limited to two medium missiles and two light missiles. Now, this seems very bad, but this wasn't really penalizing for the original mission that these carriers had. In fact, these carriers are a derivation of an old Soviet design in which the carrier was supposed just to do the local air defense of the naval group if the aircraft just had to scramble to intercept the enemy, while range probably wasn't a big concern. Obviously, for a navy that has blue water ambitions, this is a rather severe limitation. This limitation is expected to disappear when the carrier 003 is going to enter service. In fact, it is going to be a Catobar aircraft carrier with catapults. Analysts expect that the carrier wing, at least initially, will still be composed of J-15s. In fact, there are confirmed news that two prototypes with catapult bars and strengthened structures are flying right now. It is not clear if the third production batch will actually feature this variant, which is believed to be named J-15T. We will have to wait and see, but the wait is almost over. The J-20 is currently the crown jewel of the Chinese aircraft industry. We have already discussed the aircraft at length on the channel, so I won't get into too many details, but I suggest you to watch the video, link above and below. Obviously the J-20 is a land-based aircraft, so what does it have to do with the 003 carriers? Well, simple, in 2019 the Chinese press reported that the Chinese Navy had chosen the J-20 as as the new carrier-based stealth aircraft. Short thereafter, other news appeared that Chengdu was working to a naval version shortened. In fact, navalizing a ground aircraft is no easy task. The first element to consider is the role of the aircraft on the carrier. In fact, analysts do agree that J-20 is not a multi-role platform. Considering the characteristics that we know, it is expected that the two main missions of the J-20 will be BVR air superiority and long-range penetrations for ground attack with precision guided weapons. The absence of a cannon and the lack of usable external pylons greatly reduce the versatility of the platform. This means that an air wing cannot be formed by J-20 only. List at the beginning, a component of J-15 will be required. A second consideration is about the structure and the design of the aircraft itself. In fact, a naval aircraft while taking off and landing is subject to loads that are different and in generally higher than a land-based aircraft. The front gear assembly is subject to inertial loads when taking off from the catapult. The gear and the tail hook are subject to violent impulsive loads when landing. And the points where the gear legs and the tail hook are actually connected with the aircraft structure should be capable of bearing these loads 
and not breaking and this is the easy part but should also be dimensioned in a way not to show metal or material fatigue in the long term and this is a bit more difficult to design despite the fact that today you have all these kind of computer simulations and so on the whole aircraft must not be too flexible that is the wings and everything that is hanging underneath should not slam into the deck in case of a rough landing and when launching the aircraft should not arch on the catapult all of this must happen while we consider that the estate on the flight deck and in the hangar is at premium so at least the wings are better be folding and finally the marine environment is salty hence it is very corrosive so an adequate anti-corrosion treatment must be implemented all this means that a carrier based aircraft is at least a five percent heavier of an equivalent land-based aircraft so Chengdu is modifying the aircraft in order to make it suitable for carrier use and he is going to make it shorter so he's going to occupy less space so far despite the fact that the development of the j20 is usually quite quick we have seen no prototypes flying and one element that i suspect is making this job quite difficult is the aircraft configuration itself for a carrier aircraft it is desirable to have a relatively low landing speed in order to reduce the amount of energy that needs to be dissipated by the arresting gear and reduce the landing loads this is the reason why carrier aircraft tend to have wings larger and wing loads lower than equivalent land-based aircraft the j20 configuration has quite small wings and probably relies quite heavily on the body to generate lift. It isn't clear, at least it's not clear for me, if such a configuration is conducive of being adapted for carrier use. Even considering that the small wing size doesn't leave too much room for high lift devices in terms of sophisticated flaps or slats. So I wouldn't be surprised if the aircraft was undergoing a partial wing redesign just for this reason. But this is speculation, so we'll see what happens. What is not speculation though is that now we are sure that the J-20 is not the only stealth aircraft that is going to operate from the Chinese carriers. A few weeks ago an official tweet from a Chinese government account referred to an aircraft, a naval aircraft, as the J-35. This means that what has been known in the past like the FC-31 or the J-31 has now finally received an official J number, which probably means that it is going to enter service with the Chinese Navy. The aircraft originates from the losing design of the competitions that gave birth to the J-20. Shenyang, rather than abandoning the project, kept developing the aircraft autonomously. There is a long story behind this aircraft and we are going to dedicate a specific video to the J-35. However, there are some points that in the context of the composition of the carrier wing should be addressed now in this video. And to immediately address the elephant in the... <laughs> Uh, sorry, I forgot every time you mention this expression is arrived, so... So the thing in the room is the striking resemblance of the aircraft with the F-35. The common opinion is that the aircraft was designed on the basis of stolen F-35 designs. And while it is true that the theft happened, there is actually a judiciary sentence that clarifies that it is possible though that this is a misconception. In fact, in 2020, Yang Wei, who was the chief designer of the, of the J-20, published an article in a Chinese professional Iros magazine. In that article, he explained how the J-20 was designed having the F-22 and in general the American design philosophy as the reference point. But in the same article, he also states that the Shenyang competitors did not get inspiration from the American designs, but they got inspiration from older Russian designs. And the aircraft he's talking about is actually
actually the predecessor of the J35. I couldn't access the original article because it seems that now that scientific magazine is behind the Chinese Great Firewall. However, I could find references of the article in Chinese press, uh, pretty much in the same terms. So it may be possible that the article exists. You should have told me before, sir. While I was in China, I could have acquired a copy. No comment. And by the way, if you want to have access to the sources that have been used for this video, they will be published on Patreon and for uh, the channel members. So if you like what you're seeing and you want to actually support the channel, you will have access to this extra perk. However, we are not done. There is more. Vladimir Barkovsky, an executive of MIG Bureau, discussing the aircraft in 2012, despite the fact that the aircraft was featuring some solutions that have been already tested in some western design it was in fact an indigenous design how did he know well the mig bureau at the time was consulting for shenyang officially for the integration of the engines but you never know even though there are strong similarities there is a good possibility that the aircraft is in fact not a copy of the F-35. However, if you want to leave a comment that all of this is nonsense, that the aircraft is definitely a copy of the F-35 and the Chinese, after all, are only capable of cheap ripoff, please feel free. The comment section is open to everyone, even those who don't listen to the video. As I said, we will be covering the aircraft in the near future when probably a bit more information will be available, but still we have to consider which role is going to have in the carrier wing. Well, the role it is expected to cover on the 003 and 004 carrier wing is that of the multi-role light fighter. In fact, the aircraft is relatively small. It is much lighter than the J-15. It has about eight tons of payload with two internal bays that can host compact precision guided weapons. Plus, the aircraft can have up to six external pylons for uh, all kinds of payload. And it also seems that the radar will be one of our old acquaintances, but you will have to wait a dedicated video for that. Otis, did you confirm that detail on the KD-10 seeker? Unfortunately, no information is available on open source intelligence, sir. Uh, okay, I suppose we will present that as just an hypothesis. If you were not so adamantly against me penetrating the great Chinese firewall, we could have a much more extensive set of information available, sir. Otis, I told you a million times, it is illegal, it is dangerous, so no, no way, and this is final, okay? The second option in my list, sir, is buying a KD-10 for personal use, sir. <laughs> Do they sell it on AliExpress? I can check, sir. There's quite a lot of information on YouTube about Chinese air-to-air -air weapons or even surface-to-air weapons. But there's not much about air-to-ground weapons. Well, probably it's just not as glamorous as air-to-air. -air. However, we do stuff that is not easy to find anywhere else on YouTube. So in this video, we will dive deep into this magmatic sector of the Chinese aerospace. And we will focus on air-to-surface missiles built in China, not imported, built in China. The PLAF has always been historically an Air Force oriented toward the air-to-ground mission, so it is no surprise that there are several different types of weapons in use. Their history is quite complicated, and their development is rooted in technologies that have been acquired from abroad. But to be honest, the Chinese actually started developing their own solutions quite early. Today, the Chinese weapons tend to have a sort of a Russian flavor, but now they are mostly indigenous creations. The KD-20 is a paradigm of the Chinese approach to military technology. The weapon is designed and built with indigenous technologies in China, 
but those technologies are based on technology transfers from Russia and the analysis of several wreckages of American tomahawks uh, recovered around the world. So the final outcome definitely benefits from the technology and the know-how acquired, but is definitely Chinese. So the KD-20 is a land attack cruise missile with a range of about 2,000 kilometers. It is launched by the H-6K bomber that can carry up to six weapons. The warhead is conventional and the weapon is aimed at attacking high value fixed targets. It is a slightly bulky unit if compared with Western weapons, but its configuration is pretty much the same as the cruise missiles in service today everywhere else in the world. It is powered by a turbofan, it has small retractable wings, and the guidance is based on a mix of contour matching, inertial navigation, and this Mac for the terminal guide. But since the weapon was designed in the late 90s, early 2000s, we may also expect that it is actually using the Chinese Beidou uh, satellite positioning system. There is something to say about the guidance. In fact, inertia guidance is a sort of a self-contained guidance system that can take the weapon to specified coordinates but with a precision that normally is not sufficient for conventional weapons. Contour matching is based on the terrain altimetry that is used as a guide for the missile path. This map uses images of the target taken, let's say, before the attack to be matched with the images stored inside the missiles. And it turned out to be very, very precise. However, both contour matching and this Mac requires to acquire a large quantity of data before launching the weapon. In fact, it's necessary to map the terrain and taking the pictures of the target. We don't have information about how the Chinese collect, store and manage this information, but that would be very, very interesting because this is an essential part of the kill chain of the KD-20. However, it seems that there is a version in development that is going to replace this Mac with a mapping radar. This will give the weapon better all-weather performances and probably a radar image to be used is easier than a photographic image. The KD-63 is another cruise missile, but this time is derived by an anti-ship missile. Obviously, the KD-63 is a very different weapon, much more modern. In fact, it is a large weapon with a 500 kilos warhead designed to attack important and large ground fixed target from a standoff distance. The weapon is subsonic and the range is estimated to be 180 kilometers. The guidance is inertial and probably Beidou based with mid-course update. For terminal guidance, the weapon features an infrared imaging sensors that by a data link relays the image back to the launching aircraft. On the launching aircraft, the operator will lock the weapon on the target and from that point onward, the missile will dive automatically on it. The H6H and H6K bombers need to carry a small communication pod behind the bomb base to communicate with the weapon if they are. The version we have described is the KD-63B. Uh, the previous version apparently is still in service and it is characterized by the fact that rather than having an infrared sensor, it has basically a TV sensor, a camera that relays a TV image back to the aircraft. And this is not very modern, to be honest. The KD-63 is a powerful weapon and it can be very precise, but it has a fundamental weakness. It requires the aircraft to stay in the vicinity for the terminal guidance. This is an intrinsic weakness of the concept itself. And the Chinese are well aware because some sources actually say that the weapon has some fire and forget capabilities, but to what extent, we don't know.
The missiles that we have seen so far are large missiles launched by the H-6 bombers, but the Chinese also have weapons that can be used by tactical aircraft. The staple of this segment is the KD-88. It is generally considered the equivalent of the American SLAM, but actually the KD-88, in pure Russian style, is a family of weapons with various guidances and various purpose. The missile uses a small turbofan and it has a range of about 230 kilometers. The total weight is 670 kilos and the warhead is a semi-armor piercing warhead weighting 285 kilos, which is definitely respectable. There are two versions with different guidance system for the terminal guidance. There is a TV version and an infrared version. The missile has inertia guidance, but also data link for mid-course correction. And obviously, it transmits back the image taken by the sensor. The terminal guidance is a task that can be executed on the launching aircraft by an operator or by the pilot, or computer can be pre-programmed to execute the task automatically, and in this way, the weapon becomes fire and forget. In this case too, the aircraft need to carry a small external pod to communicate with the weapon. KD-88 have been seen on the JH-7A with four units, but also on the J-10 with two units and on the J-16 with two or four units. Beside the TV and the infrared guidance versions, there are two versions currently in development. There is a radar homing version and an anti-radiation version. One of the missing elements in the Chinese arsenal is a weapon in the same class as the Maverick or the Brimstone. The KD-88 is a bit too large for this task. However, this doesn't mean that they have nothing. The KD-9 and the KD-10 are long-range anti-tank missiles, but they are used only by the Z-10 and Z-19 helicopters. And they are laser-guided, which means that they are not fire and forget. However, like everything in China this time, also these family of weapons is evolving and there are pictures of a KD-10 with what is believed to be a millimeter wave sensor. A seeker like that could render the weapon fire and forget and could potentially close the gap. However, we have no news about the integration of these weapons with fixed wing platforms. So, well, Let's just wait and see. The YJ-91 is another typical Chinese story. At first sight, it may seem a simple copy of a Russian weapon, the KH-31, but it is definitely not. It is based on the KH-31, which is also produced on license in China, but it features substantial modifications. So the YJ-91 is an anti-radiation missile with a range of about 100 kilometers and a speed of Mach 3. It weights about 600 kilos with a warhead of 87 kilos. The general configuration of the weapon is definitely Russian and it is one of those Russian weapons that use ramjets to achieve these very high supersonic speeds. But everything else is different. In particular, the warhead and the guidance are definitely Chinese. The seeker has been updated and it is considered to be more effective, much more effective than the original Russian one. It is a modern multiband seeker designed to address a wide range of potential threats. Unlike the KH-31 that needs to be locked on a specific source of emissions before launch, the YJ-91 is basically independent from the electronic uh, uh, surveillance systems on the aircraft. Also, the Chinese have autonomously developed an anti-ship version. The guidance is always the same, anti-radiation, and it is supposed to lock onto the radar systems of the target. This version of the weapon is capable of terminal maneuvering, and the Mach 3 missile that is capable of terminal maneuvering is definitely 
a bad customer. However, you may expect that the speed at sea level is not Mach 3 and also the range of the missile since it needs to preserve some energy for maneuvering is not the same as the other version, probably shorter, but still it is an interesting opponent. Obviously the anti-ship version is in use with the naval aviation and can be operated either from ground or from the carriers. Obviously the inventory doesn't stop here because there are Russian weapons and services and there are older versions of Chinese weapons still in service. There's also a pretty rich landscape of guided bombs but this will be the subject of another video. And in the end, she sailed. And I have to say, it looks magnificent. In the last couple of weeks, we finally had high resolution pictures and videos of the new Chinese Type 003 because it just completed, at the time of filming, its first sea trials. Even though we recently discussed together China and the Chinese strategy, while it is time for an update specifically focused on this new aircraft carrier, and finding reliable information. It's not that easy. So the Fujian is a conventionally powered Katobar carrier built by the Jiangyan shipyard in Shanghai. It was laid down probably in late 2015 and it was launched in June 2022. And as we all have seen, it completed its first sea trial in May 2024. The Chinese are always very quick, but it is reasonable to expect at least a year of sea trials, another year of air operations trials, and some additional six months to one year to have a basic carrier wing operating from the carrier. A very basic one. Now, the sources agree that the displacement is about 72,000 tons at normal load, reaching around 81,000 at full load. Some sources give higher estimates, but this seems to be the consensus. The power plant was believed to be an integrated electric propulsion, but it is not. It has eight boilers and 14 turbines, powering four shafts with four propellers. The installed power is 160 megawatts. For comparison, the American Kitty Hawk class had 210 megawatts of power installed, but the ship was slightly larger, but it displaced about the same at full load. Obviously, there is no spec sheet that you can download from the plan website, so all these numbers and information has been collected or inferred by fragments of information appeared in the press, online, or through interviews with Chinese officials. So, while researching, I realized that not only we don't know much, but we also don't know what we don't know. And inferring too much is a dangerous game because, um, no, well, I, I'm getting ahead of me. Obviously, the major element we are interested in is the air component and its management. One of the major talking points is the adoption of electromagnetic catapults. This is often portrayed as skipping a generation because the US, before adopting the EMOS, used steam-activated catapults for more than half a century, I believe. But this is really not the case. Think of it, if you want to start building aircraft today, you don't start building wooden biplanes. You start with a general aviation monoplane made of aluminium and composites. So there was no point in trying an already obsolete technology. These catapults have gone through a long development on the ground and it seems that they went through successful tests on board launching dead weights. We will see. Three of them are installed on the ship, which is one less than any US carrier designed in modern times. This obviously has implications. The sorties rate is physically limited by the number of catapults. So why this choice? I suspect that the Chinese hit two limits. One is the room available and the other is the power available. 
We don't know the detailed design of the Chinese catapults, but it is conceivable that they are a bit larger than the American equivalent. Moreover, it is not that you just plug the power cable into the socket and you're good to go. The system for storing energy is quite complex on the American ships and we can't expect the Chinese ones to be much smaller. If anything, the first iteration of a technology is usually the bulkiest. And anyway, the ship is smaller than a Nimitz or a Ford and the three catapults are all of the same size. So, well, it sort of makes sense. Now, before the usual trolls make everyone notice in the comments, yes, I know that the emails are less impacting on the ship because they don't require steam pipes, valves and accumulators from the boilers. So thank you, okay? Furthermore, the ship doesn't have an excess of engine power available, so it is conceivable that the electric power is also limited and maybe four catapults were just too much. If this is the case, the coming type 004, which is going to be nuclear powered, may well have four catapults. We'll see. Another element influencing the air operation is the presence of just two aircraft elevators, both on the starboard side. The US carriers have three, which is better for moving the aircraft around and for redundancy. I've read some analysis that this is a heritage of the Soviet design at the root of the Liaoning and Shandong, but it seems unlikely to me the Chinese do not lack naval architects and the ship is big enough to house all three of them. So I don't have a real explanation and we will leave this for now. If you read around, there are all sorts of wild guesses related to the air wing composition. The truth is, we don't have a shred of official information. The most reasonable answer is Probably that the carrier wing composition is going to be variable and it will be tailored for the specific mission. And the mission of this aircraft carrier is going to be... Well, well, let's not put the cart ahead of the horses. So the first interesting piece of news is that the Chinese are developing a carrier variant for their advanced trainer JL-10, which is the J variant. If there was any doubt that the Chinese are really serious, this should be enough to remove them. In the years from the commissioning of the Liaoning in 2012 till today, the Chinese carriers have been focused on producing trained pilots and personnel. This is a slow process. Since this is the first Katobar carrier, there is also the necessity of extending the training of the current pilots and start establishing a new generation of personnel trained in Katobar operations. If I had to guess, the JL-10 will be the first aircraft really operating from the carrier. Of course, this won't stop the integration of other aircraft, but it will take probably a year of intensive training to have the pilots and the personnel ready to deploy a more or less complete carrier wing and fly safely to and from the carrier. The main combat component, at least at the beginning, will be based on the J-15. The J-15 isn't a great platform. It is the reverse engineering of the Russian Sohoi 33, an aircraft that the Russians themselves have been considering obsolete for many years now. However, that was what was available to the Chinese and it has contributed to creating the first and second generation of Chinese naval aviators. But the aircraft, as it is today, it is configured for stobar operations, so to operate from the Fujian, it must be modified to launch from a catapult. And since they were already back to the drawing board, this is the point that the, when the Chinese decided to fix the problem. Since the J-15 is basically a flanker, which is a platform that is almost infinitely adaptable, and since the Chinese have a massive experience in upgrading flankers, well, they basically decided to go all in. The J-15B is currently being tested because other than the structural improvement required to be catapult launched, it has been provided with an entirely new avionic suite, modernized a radar and it has been integrated with the PL-10 and the PL-15 air-to-air weapons. And since it is a multi-role aircraft, most of the Chinese air launch weapons are being integrated as well. The aircraft would benefit from some more thrust, but it seems that the engines have not been upgraded, but basically most of the rest it was. 
and they also designed a dual seater training version which in turn is the base for a dual seater electronic warfare variant the j15d it has been developed but it has never been seen operating from the Liaoning or the Shandong albeit it seems that this is going to happen because mockups have been seen on board of the Liaoning while we do not have any picture of a Katobar prototype, it is only reasonable to expect that the Fujian will carry a few of these aircraft. So, if the J-15 is overall an old aircraft, then the J-35 is exactly the opposite. The J-35 is a medium-weight fighter with stealth features. It features a general configuration similar to the F-35, but it is a totally indigenous design. The engine is the Chinese WS-13, it features two weapon bays and six wing hardpoints with an estimated maximum payload of 8 tons. The radar is a modern AESA radar and it has infrared sensors integrated into the aircraft. It is currently in development and it is unclear if it features the key fifth generation hallmark which is passive and collaborative targeting. Mockups have been seen on the Fujian, but also on the Stobar carriers, so the Chinese are likely going to operate it from all the fleet carriers. The aircraft is currently in development, and at least two prototypes are flying. The J-35 is a derivative of the Shenyang FC-31, a private venture that was heavily modified for carrier use. The first flight was in 2021, so it is still relatively early in the development to be able to say too much about it. Some say that it looks like an F-35 because China stole a large amount of classified data from Lockheed Martin. While the data leak is indeed true, if you think that this is going to simplify the life of the Chinese engineers, I think you are deluded. Whatever they found, those are not recipes to cook a dish. It's orders of magnitude more complex. Those data are useful to assess the performance of a potential opponent, they are useful as a benchmark, but if you think that you can cope with something like an F-35, you have no idea of what you're talking about. I know that I will be taking a lot of flack for this, but when it comes to anything with a high technological content, China definitely takes inspiration, but just coping is simply impossible. But there is a better reason why China is not just coping. And I will explain it right after covering what I believe is the most important element in the upcoming carrier wing. The KJ-600 is a carrier-capable AWACS. The general configuration reminds of the American E-2 uh, being a turboprop with two engines with six crew members and a large round radar on top. The radar is different from the standard configuration of the Chinese AWACS. In fact, for example, the large and ground-based KJ-2000 has fixed AISA raised arranging a triangular configuration, each covering a 120 degrees sector. In the case of the KJ-600 though, a similar arrangement would have implied quite small arrays. So the preference has been for a single one-sided rotating array. And we know that it is like this because the dielectric covers just one half of the rotodome. The aircraft sports a forest of antennas and various analysts have reason to believe that the level of integration the Chinese are going for is not inferior to what is possible with advanced data links like the American model. Moreover, from the same airframe, it is possible to derive other aircraft like anti-submarine and maritime patrol aircraft, transport aircraft, electronic warfare and surveillance and so on. I would expect to see some of these variants in a not so far future. So at the end of the day, what is going to be the carrier wing composition? Well, as I said, it may well be variable and it will be time dependent different points in time in the future it will have different compositions. If I had to hypothesize, considering what we have seen on the other Chinese carriers, there will probably be the following, or we'll say 40 to 45 combat aircraft as a mix of J-15B and J-35, 
4 to 6 J15D for electronic warfare, 4 J600 because with 4 you can maintain a 24 hours operation, 7 to 10 helicopters because the Chinese tend to have quite a lot of helicopters, some of them are AWACS and they won't be needed on the Fujian but still the Chinese like having helicopters on the carrier. It is also likely that in the near future the carrier will feature a naval variant of the J11 drone, but so far we have only artists' impression or scale models. So the first element to notice in all of this is that the effort the Chinese are pouring into creating a high-end carrier force is, simply put, enormous. At least four different aircraft types are in development and they are doing it at a pace that is unconceivable in the West. Just consider the time that the Royal Navy took to put in service the two carriers or the timeline for the new French Pang. We know for a fact that the Type 004 project has started already in Dalian and the fact that the Fujian Hull number is 18 while the Type 004 is 20 is suggesting that we are going to see another Type 003 likely built in Shanghai. I know what many will be screaming at this point, but I am a Chinese shell because the US Navy has a century of experience in running an expeditionary carrier force, while China has barely any experience. According to these people, there is no chance that China is going to become a real opponent to the US in the foreseeable future. Well, the first consideration I have is why they must be opponents? Is the art of diplomacy and compromise dead in the 21st century? I really don't understand this level of rivalry between two countries that, at the end of the day, not like they are now, but potentially, they don't need each other. It's beyond my comprehension. I actually may have an answer, but this will take us way too far. However, beyond this consideration that is mostly political, it is a fact that the Chinese do not have the culture and the experience of the US Navy or other European navies. But this is changing. With every training exercise, with every cruise, with every mission, the gap becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. The Chinese have shown remarkable abilities to grow and evolve, and wherever I look, I only see improvements. So trust me, I have no particular sympathy for the Chinese establishment, but I can't say what I don't think it is true just to cater to a public who only wants confirmation of its own bias. But leaving all this aside, there is a second and more subtle element to consider. As I said at the beginning, we have very little officially confirmed information. So obviously, we extrapolate and try to infer the solution to our questions. And in so doing, we face the risk of projecting ourselves onto the Chinese thinking. Typically, we think that if it is not like us, well, it's worse. At least when it comes to weapon systems. Well, maybe it's not true. Uh, maybe the Chinese have in mind different missions or postures than those that we would have if we were in their shoes. So just saying that the Fujian is the beginning of a force like the United States Carrier Force with the same missions and the same doctrine, well, it is not necessarily true. And actually that is my thinking. I am not sure what is going to happen. I have a couple of ideas in mind that I covered already in a different videos, but I'm sure that we will be surprised somehow. In fact, one peculiarity of the Chinese is their typical approach to the challenge. While the Russians tend to look for asymmetric solutions, the Chinese have both a symmetric and an asymmetric approach. For example, they introduced hypersonic and anti-ship ballistic weapons, which are an asymmetric threat, but they are also trying to catch up in the most symmetric competition, that is, carrier-based operations. And by the way, this is the reason why coping makes little sense if you just dig a little bit under the surface. Because if you want to reply asymmetrically, by definition, you don't have anything to copy, you need to come up with something new. But if you want to reply symmetrically, then coping is useful up to a point because you may want something better than your opponent. And for those who are now foaming at the mouth saying that everybody knows that the Chinese are only good at coping, I'm not saying that they never did, I'm saying that now they are beyond that stage. 
So I think that I put off enough people for today. If you want to go a bit deeper on this subject, there is a very long and detailed discussion on how the Chinese carrier force could be used in a real confrontation. And this is in the video that is going to appear beside me. I'm sure you will love it. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you to Patreon and members for their support and see you next time.